Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration and information on writing, publishing options and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint and lots more information at thecreativepen.com and that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 550 of the podcast and it is Friday the 7th of May 2021 as I record this. In today's show, I'm talking to Gail Carragher about the heroine's journey with a focus on the craft of writing today. And remember, just as the hero's journey is applicable to female characters, the heroine's journey applies to male characters or however you choose to apply gender in your writing or whatever gender you feel you are yourself. So I really wanted to make that clear up front. This is uh, relevant for all kinds of stories and it's more about the story structure, the relationships and the ending. And once you know more about what the heroine's journey looks like, I know you will be able to spot it, uh, that kind of story arc in books and films you enjoy and use it in your own work. So that's coming up in the interview section. In publishing news this week, an email from KDP Print just arrived about paperback printing launching in Australia on the 19th of May 2021 and that you might need to adjust your prices. And uh, this week as the show comes out, now you would have got an email, but I thought this was worth just mentioning because yes, please do adjust your auto calculated prices. And it's interesting because I I lived in Australia for five years and <laughs> print books are so expensive. So this is a really good change. Obviously, Ingram Spark uh, does print in Australia. So hopefully this will also help us sell more print books in Australia. But yeah, definitely check your dashboard after the 12th of May this week and uh, change your auto calculated prices. I uh, when I was there, I pretty much remember a new not a new thriller novel, for example, was around 30 Aussie dollars. And I was always so shocked because it's about four times the price of a UK paperback where we have such cheap paperbacks here in the UK. And uh, so I that one of the reasons I actually went, uh, started reading ebooks in the first place was because I read voraciously and I was just spending so much money on book on print books in Australia after my UK reading habit. So yeah, that's a good good news there. In other publishing news, agent Kristen Nelson, who has a very good reputation with indie authors, and she represents some pretty big names, writes about publishing house mergers as News Corp is buying Horton Mifflin Harcourt. And they also own HarperCollins and Harlequin. And in last year, in November 2020, Penguin Random House uh, is buying Simon & Schuster. So yeah, things are becoming <laughs> much smaller in the world of big publishing. I mean, bigger in one sense, but smaller in terms of the number of companies available. So Kristen talks about why this contraction significantly impacts writers and authors, including, and it's a very good article, and uh, links in the show notes as ever. She says, the merging of publishers results in the must acquire blockbuster only mentality. Tighter budgets means fewer books will be acquired and editors will be less likely to take the chance on unique creators creative voices. And, you know, authors with talent might not break out until their fourth or fifth novel. That's quite normal, but they might not take a chance on them. In other words, there is less focus on building an author and more focus on, on acquiring the obvious big book. Also, contraction squeezes out the mid-list author and also eliminates editorial positions and equals less author-friendly publishing contracts. So not great news in that sense. But from our perspective, I think this means that, again, once again, we need to welcome our traditionally published author friends into the indie space because, and also our traditionally um, you know, traditionally publishing focused editors, cover designers, what this will do is actually grow the indie community even more. And I, I love, obviously, I love this. And I think we are a hugely self-sustaining industry. All authors read books. So everyone who writes a book will read and buy many more books than they will ever write. And hence why <laughs> I always say everyone should write a book, because if everyone does write a book, everyone's going to buy and read far more books. So we should absolutely 
absolutely encourage people and help people and share the knowledge that for you is probably quite hard won. I mean, for me too, I love sharing what I know and what I've learned along the way. And we all have different experiences. So it may be that the writer groups you're in and the things you might hear on social and in groups and things like that is people worried about this type of thing. So let's empower more creators about the possibilities and counter the rise and rise of the big four with an even bigger wave of independent creators who are very diverse <laughs> and as mid-list as we like. I would be defined as a mid-list author, you know, someone who makes good living, like, you know, six figures from book sales every year, but, um, you know, it's not, has not broken out as they call it. Uh, but yeah, I think this is, you could see this as negative from one perspective, if you really want a traditional publishing deal with your English language book, but also from a positive perspective, let us open our arms and share knowledge with more uh, authors and editors and other people. So yes, welcome. <laughs> And then I used to cover things like blockchain in the futurist segment, but I am now officially moving it from futurist into the publishing section because Publishing Perspectives, which is a very uh, mainstream publishing blog and a sort of news site, reports that Frankfurt-based digital distributor Bookwire steps into the blockchain discussion, creating what it's calling a new NFT marketplace for the publishing and creator industry. So basically, this is taking NFTs mainstream by the end of the year. Now, remember, NFT stands for non-fungible token, but you can think of it as basically a digital limited edition. So uh, where you might have a physical limited run of leather bound gold embossed hardbacks, uh, an NFT is a digital equivalent where you can do certain types of things and they are unique. So it's not like at the moment when we publish an ebook, it's like you make an ebook once and it can sell as many times, millions of times, hopefully. But NFTs are, say, you create 10 original ebooks with special extra information and they there is a secondhand market. There are, you know, it's like a, a special edition, basically. Now, I talked about blockchain and NFTs with Simon Pierre Marion in episode 538. And what we discussed was that it's not really ready yet. We, we were like, oh, you know, this is going to take a while, maybe 2025 before this type of thing goes mainstream. But this accelerates it for sure. And of course, you know, Simon Pierre talked about blockchain being hopefully a sort of underpinning the bigger sites over time, the kind of technology that might underpin the services we all use. Uh, they are certainly not intending to be a uh, sort of sales site. That's not what they're aiming for. But what's interesting with Bookwire, uh, you know, they're basically saying they're announcing the intent to open the platform sometime in the autumn 2021 as an option for collectibles and digital originals such as first editions, original manuscripts and exclusive audio recordings. So I will definitely be using this. Now, I've been waiting for what might emerge as the main area for publishing. So, I mean, Bookwire might not be the only one over time, but they certainly seem to be a first mover in this area. Publishers and content creators can use the platform to offer their target groups attractive and exclusive products that meet the needs and habits of new generations of digitally influenced readers. Those digital originals linked to true digital ownership, which cannot be duplicated. So remember, this is this is a market for people who want to own original stuff. And again, special editions, there is a huge market for this type of um, collectorship as such. Bookwire's co-founding managing director John Ruerman says, for a long time we've at, we at Bookwire have been thinking about using blockchain as a technology for publishing. The potential uses of blockchain are huge. The hype around NFTs may die down but the technology is here to stay and I absolutely believe this and I don't think we'll be calling them NFTs maybe even by or the autumn. We'll just call them digital limited editions or something. And they say we want to enable blockchain solutions for our customers and the market as a whole. The NFT marketplace currently under development is a way for us to start bringing collectors, readers, users and listeners together with publishers, labels, authors and creators. So I am 
very excited about this. I hope you are too. I'm going to be doing another episode on NFTs in the next couple of weeks to get into it further and give you more ideas. But for now, if you're still uncomfortable about the whole blockchain and NFT thing, then it is time now. I thought it was going to be a couple of years, but I think it is time to start considering it in the same way as you might be thinking about crowdfunding a book, for example, or doing a special print limited edition, which I am thinking about for the print side. So yeah, I'm I'm pretty excited about this. And uh, if they're going to launch it in the fall uh, or the autumn, as we say here in England, then it might be launched at Frankfurt Book Fair in October, which I'm hoping to go to, depending on obviously <laughs> the world and the pandemic. So yeah, very exciting. In useful stuff this week, I have three things that I am excited about. The first one is I'm in an excellent ebook bundle for writers in the next couple of weeks. It's only limited edition as ever with Story Bundle. Storybundle.com forward slash writing. This bundle contains nine ebooks and a course, and there are exclusive books to this bundle, so you can get them now. I mean, they will be published later on as, as ebooks and print books probably, but right now they are exclusively in this bundle. And and a couple of them are tips about the film and TV industry from Christine Catherine Rush. Now, I've been to this as a live session and it's fascinating. So I, I personally am getting this bundle too because it's so awesome. So yes, tips about film and TV and Chris just knows everything about this stuff. So very cool. Also, Crowdfunding Your Fiction by Lauren Coleman, who has done a lot of successful Kickstarters. How to Write a Novel in Half a Month by Dean Wesley Smith and an Introduction to Social Media Marketing. Plus, the bundle also includes an author's guide to working with libraries and bookstores, the 30 day novel, cash flow for creators, write a conference proposal, which I think more and more of us need because there are so many conferences now and lots of online conferences. So you should definitely know how to write a conference proposal. Plus, my own book, Your Author Business Plan, is in the bundle. And the course is on dealing with toxic people, <laughs> which probably goes together with social media marketing. <laughs> so this is a really good bundle. You can get it for a limited time at storybundle.com forward slash writing and you can read the ebooks on whatever device you prefer. So that's the first one. Second one is that London Book Fair is online this year. And if you wanted to attend, then this is a really good time to do that wherever you are in the world. It runs online 7th to 10th of June 2021 and it is free, although the registration process takes some time. So you are definitely paying with your data. I was like, oh, it's, oh, it's free, click, you know, and then 10 minutes later, I'm still entering information. But uh, essentially, you can go as an author Author, you can attend. There's inter there'll be interesting sessions. I have been attending the live London Book Fair since 2012, and you know I've gone pretty much every year. I think since 2012. Obviously, it wasn't running last year <laughs> because of the pandemic, but uh, you can learn lots of interesting things. So you can also pay extra to attend the Writers Summit, which I think is generally pretty basic information. So I'm I'm not going to go to that, uh, but you can also join the Introduction to Rights Day, which is £75, which is about $100. Now, I've been to this in person and it is excellent. It's a full day and obviously this is all online so you can attend and it is about intellectual property rights. And what's so interesting is it's aimed at publishers. So the way they talk about all of this is from the perspective of the publisher. So you have to almost shift your head around to think differently. But this is inside knowledge of intellectual property rights. And if you want to learn more about your contracts, if you want to pursue a traditional publishing deal, or if you want to license your foreign rights or subsidiary rights, or you want to yourself publish other authors, this is really interesting information. And I think having been before, I mean, I can't guarantee that this year it will be just as amazing. But uh, I have actually booked again, because I'm going to attend some of those sessions again. I, I every time I go anywhere near intellectual property rights um, sessions, I learn more stuff. And I'm, you know, I 
figure I know quite a lot by this point, but I'm interested to learn more. So you can go to londonbookfair.co.uk and just attend the main fair uh, online or you can attend uh, some of those extra sessions. I'm not an affiliate of London Book Fair, but I have found a lot of great education there over the last um, almost a decade. And yeah, I'm looking forward to going back in person in 2022, that's for sure. And then finally, previous guest of the show, New Zealand author entrepreneur Natalie Sisson is doing a online summit May 25th to 27th called Monetize You with 10 ways to earn $10,000 per month. Now, this is aimed at female entrepreneurs who want to make multiple streams of income. So this is not books as your sole income. This is if you want to look wider. I am one of the speakers on my own multiple streams of income business model. There are also speakers on digital products, online courses, coaching, memberships, affiliate marketing and blogging, services, podcasting and more. This is 47 US dollars if you purchase before the 25th of May. So you can go to thecreativepen.com forward slash monetize and you can spell that either way with the S or the Z. So the creativepen.com forward slash monetize. And I am an affiliate of this. I'm also a speaker and uh, I do a lot of summits, but I don't promote all of them. But I um, I really like what Natalie does. I think she has some great interviews and I think this is definitely a good buy if you want to learn more about these types of multiple streams of income. But as I said, this is not focused on books. This is all the other things that you can potentially do with online monetization. So thanks for all your emails and tweets and comments this week. Marion says, another good episode. Nadine is correct about the German market. They are avid readers. I'm looking forward to return to the Frankfurt Book Fair in person and breaking into the German market. And of course, I met up with Marion in Frankfurt a couple of years ago and he came briefly on the podcast. So I look forward to seeing you there. (laughs) Eileen says, thanks for the fantastic episode. Glad I listened on. Uh, And I know many of you decide that you don't want to listen to the interviews sometimes, but glad uh, Eileen did. She says, though I'm far from translations, the information is what I need to reach a decision to think and plan to translate or not. Thanks to Tara, who sent a lovely picture of herself holding her first novel and the smile on her face is awesome. And I still feel proud of every book I write and holding it in my hand is a measurable sense of success in a way that nothing else really compares to. So yes, uh, thank you, Tara. And I'm actually getting some new headshots done soon, uh, which I'll probably talk about on the show because I haven't had, um, you know, professional headshots done for a couple of years, well, six, seven years now. I need to update my photos. <laughs> so yeah, and I've, I'm going to have some with my stack of books, my book stack, which is uh, bigger than last time. So that's exciting. Katie Bowes uh, finally sent a lovely green picture mowing in Waikato in New Zealand and listening to the backlist. And uh, I hope to be in New Zealand at the end of the year uh, seeing family. So you never know. <laughs> I might might be doing an event in New Zealand, maybe December, January, February. Who knows? I hope to make it over there anyway. At the moment, it's still a bit up in the air. So today's show is sponsored by Ingram Spark. I use Ingram Spark to print and distribute my self-published print books wide because with Ingram Spark, it's my content. They help me do more with it. So why even consider Ingram Spark if you already use something like KDP Print? Well, basically, if you're only using uh, Amazon, then you will not be able to be sold in bookstores, libraries, universities, and other print-on-demand sites in many countries. They will not even consider your book uh, because you need to offer a discount. And you'll also be available in catalogues that all these places use. So if you want to be available in bookstores and libraries and all these places, then you really have to go wide with your print book. And remember, this is not about KU. Some people say, oh, well, I'm in KU. Well, it doesn't matter (laughs) because uh, that's only for ebooks. So even if you choose to be exclusive with ebooks and or audio, you can still do print only with Ingram Spark. You'll have access to over 40,000 retailers, independent bookstores, libraries, schools, universities, chain bookstores, and more across across a global network of distributors, including bookstores like Foils, Blackwells and Waterstones in the UK. 
uk and bookshop.org uh, which has very become very popular in the pandemic booktopia in australia and new zealand chapters indigo in canada walmart target and loads of independent stores in the usa So, of course, it does mean that your books will be available to order. You'll still have to drive demand. It doesn't guarantee you will sell in these stores. But since having my books on Ingram Spark, I have had many of you send me pictures of my books in libraries. I've sold at book fairs, conventions and in physical stores like Blackwell's in Edinburgh, where we stumbled across uh, some of my books one day, which was exciting. I didn't know anything about. You can also do bulk orders. For example, you can do back of the room copies for live events. And if you work direct with schools and or bookstores, you can basically do these sort of direct orders. So I've had people email me, bookstores and various companies email me and say, can we order, say, 50 copies of How to Market a Book or 50 copies of this other book? And then I can just ship them directly from my account on Ingram and uh, just get paid for those. And it all works very, very well. So I definitely am so pleased that I started using Ingram Spark. How many years ago? Like almost four years ago now since I moved into using Spark and KDP Print. I absolutely love them and they do hardback. They do all the different things that you need. And yeah, so check it out. It's your content. Do more with it. Head on over to ingramspark.com. So this type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing. But my time and my brain and my thinking time is sponsored by my wonderful patrons. Everyone supporting the show on patreon.com, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash the creative pen. Thanks to new patron this week, Robert Steiner, and to everyone who's supporting the show and also to those of you who prefer to keep your name secret. Yes, if you support the show, I don't have to read it out. (laughs) Also, if you do support the Patreon, you don't have to keep it going for years and years and years, although obviously I'm very grateful to those of you who do. Uh, You can just support the show for a limited period if you like. So for a couple of dollars, euros, GBP, Canadian dollars, whatever, or a couple of coffees, if you're feeling generous, check it out. Oh, and you get the extra monthly Q&A audio on whatever questions you ask as a patron. So support the show at patreon.com, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash the creative pen. Right, let's get into the interview. Gail Carragher is the award-winning and New York Times best-selling author of steampunk and urban fantasy, comedy and queer romance. Her books have sold over a million copies in print and include the Parasol Protectorate and the Finishing School series. Her latest non-fiction book is The Heroine's Journey. So welcome back to the show, Gail. I'm delighted to be here. Well, I'm thrilled to be talking about this. And I was just telling you, I've got the book on my desk. It's really fantastic. But I want to start by sort of taking up a level. There are so many books on writing and you have these incredibly successful fiction career. So what drove you to get into nonfiction? It's really funny because you started out by saying her latest nonfiction. And I think this might be my only nonfiction. I was actually just pretty much driven to write this because my mother is very fond of saying that she who spots the problem is responsible for the solution. And for (laughs) for many, many years, I would sort of casually talk about the heroine's journey on panels or in writing gatherings, you know, as you do. (laughs) Because people would bring up the hero's journey and I would always say that there's an alternate, that there's it's the heroine's journey as well, because I studied it way back when I was in university, uh, when I was doing a classics minor. And and then somebody in the audience or someone else would inevitably raise their hand and be like, um, what's that? <laughs> and I'd be like, this is a 45 minute panel at a sci-fi convention. I don't have time to teach you all the heroine's journey. There's a reason that I took a course on it <laughs> in university. And so eventually I was like, well, there needs to be a book on this. And, and there is. I mean, Maureen Mordock has written a sort of Jungian psychological analysis of the heroine's journey. But that's not, I wanted to write something that was very accessible for people who make their living storytelling or people who really enjoy reading these narratives so that, that it could be easily identified and so that I could just explain what it was and how you use it. Yeah. And so I, I was eventually, I just 
felt compelled to do that because <laughs> no one else was doing it. No, and no, I no. did. I did. <laughs> yeah, no, you you did, and it and it is fantastic. And I was just saying before, I'm now seeing the heroine's journey everywhere, and which is really funny because I thought I knew what I I was doing. <laughs> And then I read your book <laughs> and I'm like, oh, this is a good, this seems like a new take, but actually it's an old take. So we're, for people listening, I mean, obviously, again, the book is great and we can't cover everything because it's just fantastic. But what are the high level differences between the hero's journey and the heroine's journey? So I'm going to have to speak about this, assuming that the people who are listening know what the hero's journey is, and we'll just put that to one side. One of the things that I do in the book is I, I go over the hero's journey from a like purely writer perspective, because I, I think readers are more familiar with it. They'll, they'll be more familiar with how I talk about it in under the vehicle of, sort of narrative analysis, and so that you're comfortable as a reader with my uh, syntax and how I'm going to talk about the narrative. So I do the hero's journey actually first, and then we get into the heroines in a big way. I'm not going to do that. Essentially, the sort of core differences between the hero and the heroine's journey have to do with motivation and objective and goals, and also how uh, concepts of victory and strength are defined. And so basically, both journeys, at least in old Western mythos, Greek, Assyrian, Egyptian, etc., um, have the same kind of pattern in terms of plot, basically, which involve withdrawal and return from civilization into, you know, liminal spaces and and nature or the outside world, and also journeys to the underworld and that kind of thing. So they're both essentially the same plot, but they are different in how the, the success of that narrative is. Is generated, and by that I mean so a hero's journey is uh, strength in uh, solo action, achieving your goal. It generally there's sort of narratives of, of continued separation, so you lose your foil, like Gilgamesh does with Enkidu and stuff like that. And and in order to achieve his ends, a hero achieves victory usually through uh, physical prowess by himself. So strength is defined as the kind of self actualization and victory over enormous odds and strife. Um, the heroine is basically the opposite in that generally speaking she acts a little bit more like a delegator or a general so she um, activates a network in order to achieve her ends and usually does so uh, by gathering people to her who will help her achieve her goal and by portioning out that achievement. She doesn't really celebrate victory of the heroine. She usually wants compromise and unity But so strength for her is just defined differently. This heroine is very good at asking for help, identifying where she has can't achieve something because she doesn't have that particular skill set. And then uh, finding people who have that skill set and using them for mutual gain. And so it's just really different in in the concepts of of how your protagonist essentially is going to be motivated. And so as a writer in particular, if you're coming up against writer's block in certain aspects of your story, if you think you're writing a hero's journey, the solution, the narrative solutions for that writer's block are going to be certain things, like putting your hero in more and more strife, in isolating them more and more so that they can then achieve their goals. Whereas if you're writing a heroine's journey, you're probably going to throw a new character into the scene that has advice to offer or something along those lines. So the, the actual sort of solutions to writer's block are different depending on which narrative you're writing. For, for example, which is, you know, one of the reasons it's important to know which journey you're on as as a writer. As a fiction yeah. writer. <laughs> uh, and it's interesting. And I, I want us to stress at the beginning here that the sex or gender of and or gender of the protagonist or the writer, in fact, and I think this is important, yeah. doesn't define which journey you're writing. So I was reading it going, OK, so I do write the hero's journey for my female character, Morgan Sierra, who's like a James Bond or a Lara Croft or a Jack Reacher sort of solo character. But then my Matt Walker series is a team series with a group of friends. And there is Sienna, but it's Sienna and her friends and it's all a group together and I hadn't known that I was doing that differently yes thank you I usually remember to say at the beginning of these interviews that gender is irrelevant and I will use him and her uh kind of just acknowledging that and the example two of the examples I use which I in the book which 
I'm sorry, I keep referencing it, but it's the only cribbing I have, um, is that the recent Wonder Woman movie is a classic hero's journey. There's no, almost no deviation from a, a hero narrative. It's, it's practically Gilgamesh on screen. In fact, mm. like everything about that movie is, is a hero's journey. Um, and Harry Potter, both the first book and the series as a whole, is a classic heroine's journey. So, and obviously that is a biologically masculine male protagonist for, for Harry Potter. And yet he is a heroine. So yes. Absolutely. The chassis we have been given have gendered narratives because of their original sources, but as they present in the modern day, they're not gendered. Yeah, I think that's I think that's really important. And just coming back to the solo versus team approach. So if we are writing a, a heroine's journey, What are the things we need to think about when we're coming up with our main character and also the supporting characters? Do we need much stronger supporting characters than we would if writing a hero's journey, for example? I think probably yes. The the thing about a hero's journey, and you can think about this in context of something like Jack Reacher or whatever, is he he does often have aid and sometimes that aid will end up being a betrayer in fact about 50 percent of the time but sometimes that aid is actually very helpful and and he does this the hero often does have a romantic interest and stuff but most of the time they're killed or removed from the narrative because because he has to be continually isolated to get stronger and so and the heroine is the opposite now you can write very very vibrant side characters for your hero and then when they die or disappear or betray it's it's a hundred times worse, obviously. But putting that aside, the heroine, you as a writer are going to be writing these incredibly vibrant characters for your heroine, side characters that are going to be assisting her and very rarely betraying her. That's pretty unusual in a heroine's journey. But what you then have from your readers is readers who fall deeply in love with these side characters. And then, because you don't have to kill them, you can pick them up and write more books with the side character as your heroine. (laughs) And so from a purely career perspective, the heroine's journey has this sort of really vibrant side effect where you can have um, what you often find in the romance genre in particular, but it's also leaking into cozy mysteries and other sort of heroine's journey dominant narratives, which is you can pick up and write a whole new series as one of your side characters, or you can write a a spin-off novel with the side character getting their romance. And this builds a a really voracious reader base. So the, the heroine's journey is actually really great at creating a kind of heroine's journey for its writers in a way, because you end up with all these great side characters. But yeah, the side characters are particularly important. And then sometimes the side character is uh, like an animal companion in, in YA fantasy, for example, that's pretty common. So yeah, your side characters are, are extremely valuable and very, very useful. And, and yes, you, you will probably end up having to write a number of them and they'll be very vibrant and you'll have readers who get very attached <laughs> right so if we want to write uh, a heroine's journey we know we've got our character we've got our side characters what are some of the aspects of structure and plot I mean you mentioned a little bit about the withdrawal and the return for example but are there any sort of key aspects in the heroine's journey when it comes to plotting so one of the things that are very important for the heroine is that isolation uh, isolation usually immobilizes her. And so it's the opposite from the hero in that the more alone she is, the less, the less she's going to do anything because she kind of has lost her network. And so she, she often will spiral when she gets alone. Um, and the Twilight books are, or movies are a very good example of that. But... Uh, so the initial driver for our hero is usually a quest of some kind or a boon that he's going to go out of civilization to achieve or, you know, war or invasion, enemy, something that's a, a big baddie that he has to battle. The heroine usually has something taken away from her, and it's usually a network of some kind. So, for example, in the Demeter myth, the, uh, Demeter's daughter is stolen away and hidden from her and raped and everything and so she her motivation then is to leave olympus leave her position of power and go seek her daughter and so 
there's a, a psychological challenge for a lot of Western authors in particular in the idea that something has been done to her. And so your character doesn't have agency, but that very idea is because we glorify the hero's journey. So, so it's kind of hard to get away from, but generally speaking, you have a broken network, that, that broken familial or friendship network that precipitates action. And then the heroine often will disguise herself. That's a real common trope in these narratives. And that's partly because her abdication of power means that she must be some, she must literally sort of try on different identities in order to formulate new networks and attempt to get her reunification in place. And so she'll go through these sort of steps of invisibility and then down into the underworld and exploration. And then part of the uptick is reclaiming her identity and her power through forming all of these new connections and eventually hopefully reestablishing the old one if you're writing a happy, <laughs> happy um, book. Mm. So yeah, those are some of the core. And it, I don't know if you've seen this. That there's a show on Netflix. So it's a movie. It's called Into the Beat. It's a German movie. Have you seen this? No, I have not. Mm-mm. Okay, so it's on Netflix right now. It only came out last week, and it's like a YA movie. Really, it's about a young ballet dancer who has this group, and her father is a ballet dancer, and and then she essentially goes and discovers hip hop and street dance and this other, oh. and of course she has to give up you know what's she gonna do is she gonna give up her you know she's sort of turned away by her father and the ballet group and she finds a new family and the hip-hop but then there's all this it's and it was so funny because I I watched the movie then I read your book and I was like oh my goodness this is a heroine's journey because there's the friendship group and the return into the network and the the broken family and then the the complete family and so if people are and I really I was like oh my goodness this is beat for beat this kind of heroine's (laughs) journey and it's a it's a yeah it's like a young person's dance movie but I really I really enjoyed it (laughs) I I have to say that that like teen dance movies are in my total wee house I love these kinds of movies I used to be a dancer that's part of it but oh uh, there we go yeah you'll enjoy it in line with in line with that also on Netflix there's a great Korean drama called The Uncanny Counter Mm. and it is also a pitch pitch perfect heroine's journey and I I thought it was going to derail into a hero's near the end and then they brought it back around and I was like oh this is great that's kind of one of these things because the plots are so similar between the two journeys sometimes you don't really know whether you as a watcher or a reader or a consumer are on a hero's journey or a heroine's journey until the end it's often sort of the ending particularly ending sort of iconography and visual as well as plots that in in television and movies that tell you which journey you're on. Um, the hero's journey often ends in sort of images of soloness and, um, and pathos uh, because one of the, the hero's defining characteristics is usually he achieves so much that he can never really fit back into a sort of family life and civilized society. And that, that comes directly from like, Gilgamesh and Heracles and characters, you know, ancient archetypes like that. So you kind of sometimes when you're on one of these, when you're watching one of these shows, you're like, where are we going? Where are we going? And then you're like, oh, yeah, it's a, if you're me, it's a heroine's journey. <laughs> it's going to have a happy ending. Everything will be OK. I am going to be <laughs> I'm going to be pleased with the show. But uh, yeah, The Uncanny Counter, which is also on Netflix, is, is a great, great example as well. And that one's uh, kind of urban fantasy. Um, so if you're if, if you're if you're not a teen movie person. <laughs> Yeah, although I find a lot of YA is directed at adults anyway, obviously. But let's just talk about, talk about the uh, genre aspect, because the book talks about the commercial side of romance, comedy, cozies and other genres that typically, more, more typically, use the heroine's journey and are undervalued by the traditional industry, although not by yeah. readers. Um, not by so, readers. <laughs> yeah, not by readers at all. But can you comment? I mean, is, is this why we have more of a predominance of the hero's journey is that the books before the rise of indie have not been valued so much really I think so I mean I certainly think I I talk a little bit about the zeitgeist and critical acclaim in terms of preferential value being placed on the hero's journey instead of the heroines I think 
some of that is cultural. Uh, we're very attracted to this idea that um, individualism and solitary action and not needing anybody and achievement is valued, is better in a way than having, having, I mean, even the language we have around it, right? Having to ask for help. Whereas the heroine is like, no, identifying that, that someone can help you and asking them is a very strong and powerful thing to do. But as a culture, we really struggle with that, which I think personally has kind of damaged Western cultures in general. But it, this goes back to the rise in genre in particular of, sort of the gothics of, during the Victorian era. For those who are unaware of the history of, of genre fiction in particular, it owes a lot of its tropes and archetypes to the gothic literary movement. And that has to do with the rise of industrialization and the education of women, the rise of the middle class and women being not only literate, but having more leisure time. And it saw this plus the rise of the yellowbacks, the penny dreadfuls, and uh, a whole narrative that was kind of targeted a female reader for the first time. And so we had this sort of simultaneous series of events going on in the mid to late 1800s, which essentially resulted in women being associated as a reader base with the Gothic literary movement, and which and the Gothic literary movement is what gave birth to romances, adventure novels, which become suspenses, but also uh, science fiction and fantasy and certain aspects of, of young adult literature as well. And so you end up with this this reader base and this narrative all being kind of packaged together with genre fiction in particular. Now, genre fiction doesn't necessarily always use the heroine's journey, but it is the predominant activator of the heroine's journey. And in the, in the long term, you had male critics being very, very sniffy about these, mm. <laughs> these gothic books that women were reading because they were sadly popular and because women loved them so much and because they, you know, they didn't deal with serious themes. And there's a whole... Um, anti-strike against science fiction and fantasy in particular, romances, of course, which persists to this day, this sort of critical disenfranchisement of, of and dismissal of these genres, which, you know, if you've come up in sci-fi fantasy, you've experienced that, uh, especially it's not as bad as it used to be. But definitely when I was younger, you know, the idea that you would read sci-fi fantasy for fun was disenfranchising that was embarrassing in a way right and it still persists to this day with romances in particular where to admit to being a romance reader at a cocktail party is asking for trouble right and that at largely that has nothing nothing whatsoever to do with the quality of the work but instead with the narrative chassis that those works are dependent upon and the fact that one of them is for lack of any other way of putting it associated with women and the other one is not yeah, I, I agree. And I remember, I mean, I, I'm not really a romance reader myself. And I do, but obviously, I've been very aware of, of the stigma. And then when I came into the indie space over a decade ago, the people who were doing the best uh, were romance readers and often still are, uh, sorry, writers and still are romance writers. And then I started to meet some of them and learning more. And I discovered that some, a lot of romance writers are incredibly well educated, business women, lawyers, yeah. And, yeah, just some really incredibly powerful women. And, you know, some men obviously write romance as well. But I was, I, after all the years of accepting the traditional narrative of what romance was, it was just incredible to meet the, the romance writers and then start to find this whole community, which I think the indie movement has has really helped. So, yeah, I agree with you on, on the acceptance of a lot of these genres. And that probably is why we don't recognise the heroine's journey as much, even though, <laughs> you know, as we're discussing, it's there. And as, as you yeah. said, the classic stories as well. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, like Jane Austen wrote romances. There's no, there's, I'm sorry, there's no other way to put that. She wrote, like, not only did she write romances, she wrote basically six of the most classic based enemies to lovers, friends to lovers, <laughs> which is Emma, I mean, enemies to lovers, Pride and Prejudice. She wrote, like, classic romance tropes that are still some of the most popular chassis for, like, romances <laughs> ever. I mean, and a lot of the, you know, the Brontes are writing tragic romances. Like, they're all, I mean, these are all... Uh, 
it was Shakespeare wrote, wrote romances, right? Oh yeah, uh, but no, yeah, absolutely. we're just we're just trained to, and and it's really, I mean, one of the the the, the things is because generally speaking, the hero's journey is more likely to end happily than a hero's journey. Most comedies are also about connection. I mean, they're about humor, but they're about connection and, and on being on a journey together, and that's how you bounce comedy off two characters. And so they're all, they also tend to be heroine's journeys. And, and one of the like fastest ways to realize how disenfranchised the heroine's journey is, is to look at how many comedies win awards at you know, the Oscars or the Golden Gloves or whatever, right? Almost never does comedy I was gonna say, I can't think of any. anything, right? <laughs> um, and that's not, that's, that's not, that doesn't say that comedy is any better or worse than tragedy or you know, serious drama, quote unquote. It's just that we don't reward it. I mean, one of the things I always say, because I, I tend to write comedy, is like, I can make someone cry so easily. It is so easily to make someone cry. But to make someone laugh in fiction is really hard. Like, I think comedy is a lot harder to do well in a way. It, it's so startling to me that it's never rewarded in, on like the award circuits and stuff. But that has a direct result. Of, that, that is a direct result of disenfranchising the heroine's journey. It also has to do with the fact that that psychologically we have this thing about negativity where, you know, you you devalue something that makes you feel better and makes you happy in a strange way. And it's a little bit like like you'll remember a negative review until the day you die, but all those positive ones go right over your head, right? It's somehow easier to to dismiss (laughs) happiness. (laughs) Yeah, that's so true. And it's interesting though, because... I there's definitely been a, a change in the pandemic year as in there's been a, a real rise in happy narrative so for example Bridgerton coming out yes. during the pandemic I don't think Bridgerton would have been as big in another year you know sure the Duke is hot and everything but I actually yes. think this more gentle happy ending type of uh, type of story is what people were craving in the pandemic and cozy mysteries have had a really amazing year and yeah uh, and I also wonder you mentioned about the issues of of the culture asking for help and I also wonder whether the millennial generation is yes. better at that than I'm Gen X I feel like we definitely I, I think you're Gen X as well right I think I am Gen X yeah 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 we're a similar age yeah. and, and we were certainly raised more like heroes like don't ask for help and all of this but yes. I I, th- I feel like maybe there will be a change that it's more acceptable now to say look I'm having some mental health issues than it yeah. used to be I, I could not agree more. I think there's also, in the younger generations in particular, there's a sort of ownership of escapism. Like, it's okay to want to escape a grim reality by reading or enjoying something positive and upbeat. And that kind of ties to ideas of, like, embrace your hyperfixation, right? If I'm obsessed with this one author because they make me laugh and I just want to comfort read them for a, a year, it's fine. Do that, you know? And I think, yeah, we didn't we didn't get that. And, and perhaps we are the last or the second to last generation um, who, who has to uh, pretend we don't love this kind of thing. I don't know. Um, <laughs> yeah. but, you're, but I think you're absolutely right. I think there is a generational shift especially in the Western world. And, but I think it's percolating into, into other countries also that, that entirely has to do with this idea that, that it's okay to be dorky about something. It's okay to love something. It's okay to want to escape something. It's okay to seek comfort in art and for that art to be comforting and, and not necessarily have to challenge you all the time in terms of self-judgment. I'm hoping that that leads to a broader acceptance of in the critical world and in the academic world of these narratives in general. Yeah, I hope so too. So uh, I want to ask you a bit more about the writing process, first of all, because you've written goodness knows how many now (laughs) novels, tons of novels, so many many novels. 
and you, you've sold over a million copies in print and tons in, in digital. But this is, as you said at the beginning, this is the nonfiction book. It might be the only one. So how did you, how did you find the writing process with nonfiction when you're so used to fiction? And any tips for fiction authors who want to try it? Oh, okay. Well, one of the tips is talk to and listen to Joanna Penn. <laughs> um, because I am a fiction writer and I have been in it this industry for a long time. And because in a strange way, I've always acted like a heroine in terms of um, my career as well. I tend to gather people around me whose advice I, I like consult and take and stuff. Um, Merle Lafferty is a, is a good friend of mine. And so basically when I was like, okay, I'm going to try this nonfiction thing. I reached out to a bunch of my fiction author friends who I knew also wrote nonfiction. And I was like, tell me what I'm in for. Can I ask your advice on how to do this, whether I should do this, whether I should distribute traditionally or not? I had a whole conversation. I I am a hybrid author, so I have both traditional and and indie and small press and everything. And so I, I talked to people like you, but I also talked to my agent. And I was like, who only reps fiction. I was like, if I wrote nonfiction, would you be willing to give it a try? I did a lot of gathering of information as part of this process. But from a purely mechanical perspective, I, I started, like I said, mentioning this journey at conventions, and then more and more people, particularly the romance authors, got interested in it. And so I was invited to speak on it. And so I developed a like one-hour talk with a deck, um, and that became a whole day seminar, like a six hour <laughs> talk with a with a deck and everything. And that kind of basically turned into the book. So the presentation and the book aren't exactly the same, but essentially that presentation gave me the the like layout for a nonfiction book without me really realizing it. And so what I essentially did was kind of gave the talk and dictated it section by section as if I were doing that and that gave me my like initial and I recorded that I recorded it I had it transcribed uh, by my computer as I dictated <laughs> and that then which is a lot easier let me say with with the uh, nonfiction than with fiction because with fiction you have all these weird names and places and stuff whereas nonfiction is just sentence by sentence and then that became it I mean it required a ton of editing and and research and I had to go in and refined all of my sources and all of that sort of thing. It was hard work. For me, after, you know, 30 odd novels or whatever it is, this juncture, writing nonfiction was so much harder than fiction. Mm. Because it's so much more meticulous. It's so much more. And I'm, I'm such an academic at heart that I was like, well, I can't make that statement if I don't back that up. Like I had to double check and make sure I can include a movie quote in, in a, no, can't, can't. It turns out you can't do that. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. So I had raw quotes of the mythological translation. And then I was like, that's not a, you know, technically, if you're doing critical analysis, it's allowed. But if I'm going to go India and I want to open myself up for legal stuff, so I'll do paraphrasing instead. So I had to rewrite all of the myths that I talked, the course, I had three core myths in this book where I talk about that, that are foundational to the heroine's journey. And I had to rewrite them in my own tone. But that's fine. I just took that as a challenge. Like I can be silly and funny with these myths then. <laughs> but it was a lot. It was a lot of work. It was way more work than the fiction is for me personally. Wow. Um, which is one and of the reasons I'm lazy, which is one of the reasons I'm like, I don't know if I want to do this again. <laughs> Well, I do, like, as you said, you're an academic at heart and the book is is incredibly well referenced. But it's interesting you mentioned those myths there because people do this with myths. They think, oh, you know, it's the Odyssey or whatever. So I can just copy bits because it's really old, right? So it's out of copyright. But as you said, the translation is possibly not out of copyright. And exactly. it's the same with the Bible, for example. Although to be fair with the Bible, it's often fair use because it's just a quote, you know, just one verse or whatever but I think that's a really important point for people to consider with with methodological things and stuff that you think oh that's really old so it must be out of copyright (laughs) exactly exactly yeah translations are copyright especially like ancient language translations but you can look into the debate over something like more recent translations of the odyssey or what have you to kind of understand why and that's because the translator has to put an interpretive bent on what they're translating because of the nature of language and linguistics and the bifurcation of 
modern, uh, you know, ling- linguistic references and ancient ones. And so as a result, a translation is, is almost an interpretation. And that makes it uh, entirely copyrighted. Uh, you know? Yeah. Um, and I just, yeah. I basically just like, I don't want to get into any other legal territory. I'm going to avoid the whole thing. So fair use is also for those who don't know, it, it is, it can be quite a gray area. So you have to be very, very careful with fair use, especially in a litigious country like the United States, which is where I'm primarily published. So I just tried to avoid the whole thing. No, <laughs> fair, fair enough. For me, that was, yeah, that was like paraphrasing and retelling things and then being like, and here's the original. If you want to go read it yourself, go read it. <laughs> yeah, it's actually, I was just thinking, I just ordered a feminist translation of Beowulf. It's it's only just come yes. out. Oh, you've yes, got that I've too, have you? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, really interesting. And I, I love this because these old myths, you can take and rejig them. And it's obviously, we have a lot of altern- alternative fairy tales that are being published. And, and I love this because our literature and myth is so deep and, and resonant and full of imagery that we use in daily life. But in questioning it, as you've done with the heroine's journey and like this feminist Beowulf, it's, and I, I bought it because I was like, like, how on earth is this going to work? But it, yeah. it's, it's very interesting. Now, we're almost out of time. I also wanted to ask you about book marketing because marketing nonfiction is very different oh. to fiction. And you've put this under your same name. You've just used Gail yeah. Carragher. So what have you noticed around marketing nonfiction and how's that been? So one <laughs> uh, of the things that is one of those uh, action items on my calendar that I keep moving from one Monday to the next Monday, which is Mondays are my business days, is run an advertising campaign on the heroine's journey. I still haven't done it, and I really should, because partly because I'm um, a data junkie. I'd be very interested to see how it compares to to sales of uh, or how you know, like an Amazon ad run works with uh, with my fiction. So putting that aside, admitting to the fact that I actually haven't read any uh, payout marketing, there are a couple of things that I have noticed are particularly significant with the heroine's journey. And the the biggest one is how high my print sales are compared to my digital ones. It is insane. There it is, mostly on my Amazon dashboard, but in general, the spikes of print versus digital sales, right? We're all used to seeing those. And the number of print editions that I sell um, for nonfiction is, you know, four or five times what I sell in fiction. It is insane. And I come out of traditional, so I already have more print sales in general for my indie stuff than most purely indie authors. But the nonfiction one, whew. So I spent, actually, I learned vellum and spent a lot from you, in part. <laughs> I watched your video on the subject. <laughs> <Awesome>. <laughs> Um, and then I uh, spent a lot of time. I even used your code. Uh, so you'll get a kickback. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yes, which everyone should do. But uh, specifically with this book in mind, because again, coming out of academia, I knew how important for me as way back in the day, the, the layout and presentation of a print nonfiction was because you want to be able to take notes and you want to be able to flip to the right chapter quickly and all those, and you want to be able to, you don't necessarily read a nonfiction book linearly. Sometimes you just jump over the mythological retelling section to the beat section where it's break, broken down. Like some people, you want to cater to the taste of uh, a nonfiction reader differently than a fiction reader. And being aware that I was solving a problem as a nonfiction author for a couple of different readers, writers primarily, but also like screenwriters and scriptwriters, but also a reader base who's interested in understanding their own taste and why they gravitate to these myths. I presented it in such a way that you could flip it to different sections depending on what your background is as a reader coming to this nonfiction book. But that meant the layout of nonfiction is something that you really have to be thoughtful about and focus on as far as I'm concerned. Um, So I'm deeply proud of the print layout of this book, um, which turned out to be a good thing because it sells so much in print. So that is a big thing for me is like if you are writing nonfiction, definitely pay much closer attention to and focus on, even if you're indie, um, on your print edition. And I would encourage everybody to try and get a print edition out to the market as quickly as possible. 
Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Are you going to narrate the audio book? No, it's done already. Uh, okay. Now, the audio book is performing way less well for me than my fiction audio. And I'm not entirely sure why I have to triage that one. I think it's audio I need to run ads on, actually. I had a friend narrate it who is an author friend of mine who also does audio named Stella Hutchins. And she has a similar kind of voice tone to me. And also she's very familiar with my voice and style because we do writing retreats together pretty regularly. <laughs> so I chose her because she sounded totally like me. I thought about doing it myself. And then I decided that, no, I hate my own voice. I don't want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> no, fair, fair enough. And what about a workbook edition? Have you considered that? No, because essentially I don't, really think about this as a crafting book I I don't want to teach people how to write that's really not something I want to do with my life at all Mm. it's more like you like you opened this conversation saying now you see the heroine's journey everywhere and that for me that was really my end goal with this book is mostly to train people's eye so that they notice it more and realize it and for writers realize when they're using it and for readers realize that they like it and why they gravitate towards it. Like that was really my end goal. And I genuinely like stick it, stuck it out to the universe. And now I'm really hoping that more people write about this, more people study it. I mean, I was, I could not have been more thrilled to be contacted recently by somebody doing their PhD on this. Finally, I'm really hoping we just get someone else writing a workbook for it and someone else <laughs> writing a writing an actual like solid craft book for it and stuff like that. Like, please, other people pick this up and run with it. My end goal for this, and that, that I guess that is something I would really encourage people switching from fiction to nonfiction to think about also, which is what is your actual goal with the nonfiction book? What, what problem are you attempting to solve for? Because that's primarily what a nonfiction book should do. But also... What is your SMART goal with that book? Like, are you writing an S-M-A-R-T SMART goal? Like, are you writing this to make money? Are you writing this to diversify? Do you want to, like, pursue not? Are you writing this because you'd like to do speaking gigs on this particular subject? And none of those were my SMART goals for this book. My, my real SMART goal was just when I do conventions for the rest of my life and I start talking about the heroine's journey and somebody says, how can I learn more? I now have a thing that I can be like, strangely enough, I wrote a book. That's how you learn more about it. Um, that's really like my end goal was really just to start the conversation on this. That was it. So, um, yeah, fair enough. And I, I mean, I often do the same thing. If you get the same questions over and over again, then write a book on it and then you don't have to keep answering those questions. But I do want to point out to people that in the book, you do have a whole section on how to write like a heroine. I do. So even though yeah. it's not, you know, entirely a how to write in this way, there is a massive section on it and it's really useful where it, you do go into. That's uh, true. I do. Yeah. <laughs> so that I is very agree. actionable. Yeah. It is. It is. Yeah, there is a whole section, but it's not written like here's like set the structure on how to write. Like it's it's more written like here's like the most common tropes and characters that you can activate in your style, in your way, however you'd like to ap- apply it. Like here's the basic beat structure, like she save the cat, right? Like I put that, I, I do do that all for you. Yes. But I don't know. I, I'm just like weirdly nervous about instructing people on how to write but I don't know I, that makes me feel very uncomfortable <laughs> which is great which is crazy because you've written so many books but um Gail it's a fantastic book and obviously you've got your wonderful fiction as well so where can people find you and everything you do online you can go to my website which is gailcarriger.com g-a-i-l-c-a-r-r-i-d-e-r uh, but if you Google kind of any iteration of Gail Carragher, my website should come up first. I try really hard to own that SEO. <laughs> and you can find The Heroine's Journey as The Heroine's Journey. Again, hopefully in most top searches on, on I'm a wide author. So it should be available as widely as possible. And you can also, uh, my website, the book page for The Heroine's Journey also has all of my references and all that sort of thing. Because... I wanted to make sure audio, I didn't want to have my poor audiobook narrator have to read all of my references. Um, so. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, so they're just all there online as well as in print and digital edition. And that's 
including live links to online sources and all that sort of thing. Um, and that's also because I really want this to be as open source as possible in terms of the knowledge I'm trying to get out into the world. So, Brilliant. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for your time, Gail. That was great. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, and have fun identifying the narrative <laughs> all over the place now. <laughs> So I hope you enjoyed the interview with Gail today and that it's given you some ideas for your story. And I guarantee you, if you start watching out for some of these aspects of the heroine's journey, you're going to see it everywhere. So next week, I'm talking to James Blatch, who many of you know from the self-publishing show and the self-publishing formula courses like Ads for Authors. We talk about the challenges of writing and publishing your first novel, even if you've been embedded in the indie author community for years, which James absolutely has, as well as what your definition of success could be with one novel and managing your time across multiple businesses. So that's coming up next week. Happy writing, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.